And we eventually put it together in this book called Everything That Rises. And just to give you a sense of what that was like, on one page we had these two images from 1952, uh, a Jackson Pollock, obviously, but also a Time Life Books, Galaxies and Collision. What was interesting about that was the way that all the critics writing about Jackson Pollock at the time used this language of nebulae, galactic. My favorite thing was, these paintings are so silent. Um, yeah, uh, but I think what they meant, and I think it is true, is that they look so explosive that the silence is the silence of outer space. It is this kind of silence of a vacuum and, and so forth. And so that was fairly common, but then I pointed out that his, his confederate Rothko, you know, you've got the standard his, history of Rothko of how the, gradually the, the, the clouds of color kind of congeal and then they get darker and darker, and toward the end he's really, really dark, and by the very end he's just almost black and white, and that's because he's about to commit suicide, and uh, that's the story. And when you go through a Rothko show, you have that projection, which is very sobering. But then one day I was doing one of those shows, and I noticed the date on that last painting, uh, and it was summer of 1969. And I asked myself, what else was going on in the summer of 1969? and it was the moon landing. And I am not in any way, and the important thing about all this is not to be reduct reductionist. I am not saying that you know one of the great artists of the 20th century got his imagery from what was on television. But I am suggesting what would it have been like for Rothko that terrible last summer to have seen the moon landing, this absolutely amazing human endeavor, this incredible uh, uh, leap of, uh, for mankind and so forth. And, and what was there when we got there? Nothing, in some profound way. I've always thought one thing that was interesting about the moon was that it, you could tell it was day on the moon because the, the ground was shining. Um, but but uh, why is it doing that? Go back. Anyway, um, but uh, so it's that sort of thing where you're trying to figure out a way. It, 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 the convergence is, is two things looking like that you wouldn't necessarily think, but then they, uh, or that's, that's the rhyme, and then the convergence is the poem that goes with it, is thinking through what the implications are. For example, here in the book, somebody once showed me um, this uh, uh, picture from a book of landscapes of Latin America, Venezuela in this case, and I said, oh God, look at that, that's the Rokeby Venus. And my friend said, you are really sick. And, and, uh, but then I said, oh, in fact, wait, look closely. I don't have the thing, but there's that line that goes, there's a path there. And I said, wait a second, it's not the Rokeby Venus, it's the Man Ray Lips. Wait a second, the Rokeby Venus is the Man Ray Lips. And if you look, look at the, the lips, if you look at it that way. And uh, particularly, I, wish, I, I don't have a little pointer if there was one, but uh, the, the, her elbow off to the side, now, now look at this. Now, what's interesting about this, of course, this is Man Ray's uh, Hour of the Observatory. Does anybody know why it's called the Hour of the Observatory, besides the fact that there is an observatory in it? It has to do with the fact that uh, in... Gosh, don't stay there. No, no, it's not. Everything's getting all mixed up. Stay there. How did I make it... Why is it going... Why is it moving forward on its own? Anyway, you didn't see all that. Um, <laughs> the fact is that... Uh, in 1886, when there was a conference to set up time zones around the world to establish Greenwich as, as zero degrees, the vote at the Treaty of Washington uh, was, uh, it was 1884 actually, excuse me, and the vote was 42 to one, to one that it would be Greenwich as zero degrees, and the one was France. And France insisted that the Paris Observatory, which you see there, would be zero degrees. And so when Lee Miller left uh, Man Ray, um, he, uh, he described th that was zero degrees, the moment of deepest depth of abyss of feeling for him, so that's why it was the, the thing. But anyway, of course, I, uh, uh, let me just see here. Um, you know, I was saying to myself, I'm going a little bit crazy. Even I was thinking that was a little bit of a stretch, except that then I saw this photograph that Man Ray took himself in his own bedroom with the picture above it. That, by the way, painting, you know, the, the Hour of the Observatory is 1933, Man Ray in Paris, and that's 1933, Chagall in Paris. I mean, it, it does seem to be very, very much based on it, 
or something's going on. I'm not sure what's going on. And at that point, I decided it was time to do the lecture I'm about to do, which is trying to figure out what's going on when two things look alike. And to do the whole uh, typology, it's, I, I kind of feel like a Victorian uh, uh, scientist with his little box of mosquitoes and, and butterflies and so forth and, show, and organizing them in some way and doing a taxonomy of text uh, to try and figure out what might be going on. So with that in the back of your mind, and you have that on your the, the picture, we're going to ask what we're going to toward a taxonomy of convergences. And uh, at one extreme, at the very, very far extreme, is a word which you've never used before, but you're going to start using every day because it's such a cute word. There it is, apophenia. Apophenia is the tendency of human beings to see uh, parallels or to see matches where there are no parallels. So for example, a good example of, of apophenia is, I could show you the movie, I'm actually, for time reasons I won't, but you, how many of you have seen uh, Godard's film, Two or Three Things I Know About Her? There's that amazing scene where uh, the woman is in a cafe and she uh, is looking at the swirl of sediment just swirling around inside of her, uh, inside of her cup. And by the way, you'll never have this experience on your home video monitor. This has to be in a theater because what, Godard has this amazing moment where he just, the entire screen becomes brown and you are in the coffee cup, you know, you are in the coffee cup world. And you can't help but think as you watch the swirling sediment of galaxies or as you watch the bubbles, eventually they separate out. And you can't help but think of cells separation and so forth. And that is an example of apophenia. We just have a tendency to just project these thoughts and we all project often the same thoughts. Um, uh, so you're seeing parallels where there are no parallels, but you just see them because we tend to do that. An example of apophenia when, uh, is obviously projection. That's the kind of thing that happens in a, in a Rorschach test. Uh, somebody made that Rorschach drawing. I think that's pretty nice. Um, and when it gets extreme, you get to paranoia. Um, there's that film 23. Um, uh, which is uh, uh, Carrie is, is everything he sees adds up to 23 and he starts seeing 23 everywhere and he just gets compelled. And this is the 23rd slide. Anyway, but I think that's paranoia. Uh, and then you get other wonderful things. You get, you know, the guy at the demonstration, the Tea Party demonstration saying, God and Obama, neither has a birth certificate. or this edition of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, in which Jews turn out to be responsible not only for capitalism and masonry and, and uh, the, so, uh, you know, uh, communism and Christianity, but they're also responsible for Nazism. So you know, it's, it's all little puppets, and that's, that's kind of extreme apophenia. Now moving over, we're gonna continue just moving like on a spectrum of, of, of convergent effects. And the next one is just accident or coincidence. Um, one of the things might be what we call, using Francis Bacon's words, chance and the shuffle of things, which is the kind of thing you get when on two pages a spread at The Economist, the guy from the ad walks out of the ad into the picture, or the next picture over. You know, and, and base, you see that thing all the, kind of thing all the time, and, and the main thing to say about it is how many times you don't see it. I mean, that's, that accounts for it. I mean, most times that doesn't happen, but every once in a while it does, and it's really kind of weird when it does, and it's really, really weird when this happens. When the back of The Economist, the week that 9-11 happened, featured that ad for Lufthansa. That was the ad that was the week before 9-11. And, and that you ended up in a situation where those two cover, the back of the cover and the cover on the newsstand at the same time. So that's just coincidence. But then there's a special kind of coincidence which is separated at birth, you know, you know Kurt Anderson and the people at Spy did a whole thing about how, you know, Don Knotts and Mick Jagger are obvious twins. It doesn't necessarily mean anything, on the other hand, it might. Uh, there's something about the Rolling Stones. They all seem to um, have separated at birth kind of situations going. Uh, Charlie Watts and Buster Keaton. That raises the issue that's quite interesting because Buster Keaton, in turn, looks exactly like Samuel Beckett. And indeed, Samuel Beckett used Buster Keaton in some films of his, of his plays. But what's weird there is that a person who really, really loved Buster Keaton movies was Wittgenstein. I don't know. 
Uh, sometimes these are more meaningful than others. This was one from the book. Um, these uh, had, uh, uh, issues were very close to each other, and this was the time when Newt Gingrich was shutting down the American government and Milosevic was blowing up Yugoslavia. And, and I did an article at that point called Pillsbury Doughboy Messiahs and was able to point out that actually their politics were very similar. Not, I'm not saying that, Milosev, that Gingrich was a war criminal, but rather that, he, that both of these people were complete cynics that glommed on. In the case of you know, Gingrich, he literally poll tested a, his contract with America. You know, he didn't, he didn't care what it was going to be, but once he had it, he then went with it. In the case of Milosevic, he just stumbled onto Serbian nationalism and then wrote it. And in both cases, they kind of lose control of, of their minions and, and things go too far. Uh, so they had kind of parallel histories. And I have a whole bunch of pictures in the book of how, and you can't tell, at a certain point you can't tell which one is which. Um, they are both, uh, as I say, Pillsbury, Doughboy, Messiahs. And then apparently the people at the Colbert Report uh, have been reading the book because uh, they had that for the Macy's Day Parade at one point. Then you go from separated at birth to the transubstantiated in death, which are the, when, when stains start looking like the Virgin Mary. Uh, or toast looks like uh, the Virgin Mary, burnt toast. You get them all over the world. That one on the far left is in Australia, where uh, a little tiny town way, way in the outback suddenly had this shadow because of, uh, that looked like Jesus. Um, and for six months, the town was overrun. There wasn't even a hotel in the town, and people were coming from miles away to see this miracle, which ended when, uh, when winter came. You have the Shroud of Turin, it's, it's all, it goes across all kinds of, of religions. This was during uh, one of the, the Gaza incursion. There was a lamb that was born that apparently had the word Allah on, on its side. This is not only a thing that happens in religion, you also have the jelly bean phenomenon. Um, and then one of the weirder ones was this one here. Um, a year after John Paul died, there was a bonfire for the anniversary of his de the, to commemorate his death in Krakow. And the guy who took this picture, think about this for a second, there was not a single moment when the flames looked like that. Or rather, there was an instantaneous second where they looked like that when he happened to snap the picture. And he only realized it when he got home and looked at his, spread, at his, uh, at his uh, tear sheets and so forth. And this has been officially included in the beatification folders that this miracle of, of Jesus, uh, of John Paul showing up in Krakow, waving to people as a flame. What was weird was that at exactly the same time there was a Maurizio Catalan show uh, which included this in, in, in uh, Warsaw, and this had to be shut down. Pope on fire, good. Pope put by meteorite, bad. Um, but it, it, you get this kind of thing all over the place. There was a moment, there was a solar flare a, f a few months back, which of course is, uh, you know. So anyway, that's, you get that kind of thing happening all the time, and there's not terribly much you can say about it. Now we're moving on, and we're going, we're going from things that really are completely meaningless or mostly meaningless to things that are, seem to be, have some more substance to them. And obviously, you get the most obvious example is that of affinities. Uh, there was a whole controversy about this show uh, several years ago at, the, at MoMA uh, about whether it was colonializing or, or, you know, orientalizing and so forth. But the fact of the matter is that the early modernists, the early Cubists uh, and so forth uh, and, and the Surrealists were very, very much drawn uh, to, quote, primitive art or specifically art that was African art and that was in the Musée de l'Homme and was basically the art of colonialism. It was all the stuff that was the, the trophies of, of the French colonies were brought, and they just seemed to have incredible impact on, on the trajectory of modern art. The reason you can make various arguments for the, for the affinity, I would argue that, uh, that at a point when modern art was trying to get away from the tyranny of one-point perspective, uh, this was a tradition that had never had one-point perspective and that that would have been a reason for the affinity, which is why Van Gogh was interested in Japan, Japanese art and so forth. Uh, what's been fun in the meantime is that it's been, uh, there's been a double reversal on this, and there's an artist from Benin named Romald Hazume, who uses old Western detritus gas tanks and, and uh, you know, uh, brushed, uh, bottle brushes and, and, uh, and uh, 
earphones and, and turns them into primitive art. Uh, that, that, he, he did that about five years ago, actually. So it's a kind of, it's, a, it's Africa turning the tables on that. Um, moving further along, we now get to co-causation. I mean, the reason things look alike is because they share a, a, a cause. Uh, I don't think that the torturers at Abu Ghraib, those kids who are in their 19s and 20s, uh, trust that guy up that way because they were making a, a homage to the, the monument for the dead of the, of the Somme, uh, the Battle of the Somme in World War I. Um, it is an uncanny. These two books were side by side at a, on a book table one day. And, uh, and of course, the reason they're both uh, using that as they are again using Christological motifs. The thing that's especially strange about the Abu Ghraib thing is there was a blurring of the motifs, which is to say that it was both the crucifixion and the mocking of Christ at the same time. You'll remember that they put a wire around the finger of, of, of the guy who they had holding his hands out like this, uh, even though the wire wasn't plugged in and there was no danger he was going to be electrocuted, but they just thought it was hilarious that he was you know, freaking out because of it. Uh, so there was a kind of confusion in this gesture of both the mocking of Christ and the crucifixion. The others are more straightforward. Similarly, this thing, kind of thing happens in nature where across all sorts of phyla you'll get the same thing. You'll get flying. It's not because you know, birds led to bats who led to butterflies, it's that the strategy of flight uh, appears in different phyla and the same kind of thing is used over and over again by nature. Uh, presumably partly things start to fall and the ones that don't crash and burn that seem to be able to float a bit or have a better chance of survival. Um, but they're, they're, and, and then in fact uh, it turns out that the thing I was telling you before about, uh, about this being apophenia is not true. Uh, what's going on inside the coffee cup when you look inside of it is best explained by a phys physicist named Sidney Perkovitz who has written a book called Ultimate Foam from Cappuccino to the Cosmos. Mm -hmm. And basically what's going on in your cappuccino is in fact the same laws that are, are governing uh, gravity and so forth in the cosmos. Here's a good one, by the way. Uh, this, is a this was sent to me b by somebody uh, in Brooklyn a upscale McDonald's that has the, this beautiful uh, posters on the wall that look exactly like Rothko's hung sideways because they are Rothko's hung sideways. <laughs> okay, so moving along, uh, you get to this phenomenon of zeitgeist, which is you know this phenomenon. Like, why are there all these vampire things simultaneously happening? Why uh, there's a uh, um, you, there are all kinds, in fact, I'm sure, how many of you gave that paper today at the conference? I mean, that's, that's a standard paper at graduate conferences at this, at this point about why, that was about three years ago, I guess. Um, but anyway, an interesting thing about the zeitgeist phenomenon, however, is that almost always it comes in, in, in a binary fashion, so that if you're going to have the Beatles, you'll also have the Rolling Stones. You're going to have the, you know, the vanilla, vanilla version and the spicy version. So that if, if you're going to have Michael Jackson, you'll have Prince. If you're going to have uh, Madonna, you'll have Cyndi Lauper. Um, in politics, if you're going to have Malcolm X, you'll have uh, Martin Luther King, you'll have Malcolm X. Um, there, it's, this seems to happen over and over again in versions of the zeitgeist. Um, another thing, is, uh, just one recent case that was just remarkable uh, was about two years ago, I guess, three years ago, two films came out the same week that had obviously been being made at the same time, and unbeknownst to the two sets of, of uh, directors and writers, uh, they were both based on a huge moon suddenly looming uh, a, a on the horizon, uh, Melancholia and, uh, and Another Earth. In both cases, they were the moon was there as a metaphor for the depressive woman who was the lead character. Um, and uh, in both cases you had the scene where she was outside and suddenly she was just staring open mouthed at what was happening. And in both cases, two completely sets of filmmakers realized that if this happened, the thing that the women would do is get naked and go lie outside. <laughs> at the same angle. And I assume that, that what that is, in some sense, uh, playing off of is, is Diana, the goddess of the moon, and, and that's probably playing off of that, but it, it is weird when it happens. 
another thing along the same lines is cross metaphors. Where, so for example, when the Costa Concordia sinks, every single political cartoonist does the same cartoon. It, it was sinking more or less at the same time as the uh, economic crisis was happening, and the and the famously the the uh, captain had left the ship, and so there's all this stuff about you know uh, you know various metaphors of of the debt crisis or or uh, Obama saying let it rip you know and the whole thing is sunk. This happened everywhere in the world. The same everybody had the same idea. Um, another version of that is the famous meme situation. Um, um, and that, for example, you have the famous meme of the, uh, of the uh, pepper spraying uh, policeman during Occupy Wall Street who suddenly started showing up everywhere. Uh, and uh, um, that you could say a lot more about memes, uh, but I'll refrain from here. Let's go further along, and you're now in the land of illusion. Very often artists allude to each other. And in one case, here we have, for example, invocation, and, I, and it's been argued quite persuasively that Rembrandt, when he's doing this picture of a thief who is being dissected with a kind of loincloth, is clearly alluding to uh, the, the images of the deposition of, of Christ. It seems to me, now this is me talking and not, and not uh, Berger, but that it's because of this, of going from here, from Christ through that image into that photograph, that you end up with this. And I'm not saying, I'm not here talking about politics, I'm just talking about how images go from one thing to the next. If, if Che Guevara had looked like this on the day of his death, it wouldn't have worked. Now, does anybody know who that is? That is Che Guevara. Uh, in a passport photo, uh, uh, on a photo, he was traveling as an Argentinian businessman to Africa. Um, but if he had been that way when he was killed, it wouldn't have worked. Um, but because he was wearing, uh, was bearded and so forth, you have that whole kind of thing, and you have the resurrection of the life, and you have the deification of Che and so forth. Another example of invocation, very interesting, famous one, is, is Goya uh, painting. Uh, the third of this is the third of May, I believe, in in Madrid, and what has happened is the day before, uh, Napoleonic troops have invaded Madrid, and people have surrendered uh, under a good faith surrender, and in fact, the troops then kill them. This is not me. So turn off your phones. Anyway, uh, but uh, but uh, what's fascinating is that. Uh, that's Napoleonic troops, French troops, effectively, shooting Madrid citizens. By the way, there's a Christological kind of thing going on also, once again. And then, uh, some 60 years la later, Napoleon's uh, grandnephew, Napoleon III, imposes an emperor on Mexico, Maximilian, who then the Mexicans rise up and overthrow him and shoot him, and again you have a Christological thing, the sombrero, uh, halo, and the two, two confederates on either side. And obviously Manet is noticing that here, whereas before you had French troops killing Spanish speakers, here you have Spanish speakers killing French, and, and, and so there's a, that kind of thing going on. That's illusion. Then you get the phenomenon of homage, and uh, whereas, uh, using the example of Hockney, never talks about about Matisse, he talks about Picasso all the time. And uh, this is a, uh, actually needed early on as a young man and his, and his master, um, Stravinsky and W.H. Auden again. Uh, you know, he's always making, he's, he's kind of invoking Picasso. And when he goes to see uh, the Picasso Museum, he makes sure to show him, have a picture of himself smoking a cigarette the same way that his master does. And, um, and in the same way, I would say that this whole lecture is, a, is an homage on my part to John Berger, who is my master. Moving along, you get to the phenomenon of pun, which is why you have the passion of the Spider-Man. Um, or for that matter, uh, that scene in M.A.S.H. where the Last Supper suddenly begins to happen. Um, and we get to the phenomenon of appropriation. And that is, of course, what, uh, what when uh, Andy Warhol wants to do a Rothko of his own, he does a Campbell's soup can. 
and uh, he does a Brillo pad uh, box, and, and this is not only just appropriating imagery from industrial so, so forth, but he is appropriating the idea of appropriation from Duchamp, who was the first of the appropriators who just, now the story goes, by the way, that this is a very mixed up story. The story goes that Duchamp took a urinal, put it on a pedestal, signed it, uh, and declared it art. But that's manifestly not what he did, if you think about it. He took the urinal, put it on a pedestal on its side, and by doing that, and when Edward Steichen did the first official photograph, he was creating a holy object, a Buddha or a Pieta. Um, it was very consciously transubstantiating this thing, not only turning it into art, but turning it into kind of holy art, or art as holiness and so forth. Now what's interesting about these, this pairing is that, as you know, there was a catastrophic moment in the early 60s when a mad anarchist named Laszlo Toth attacked the Pieta with a hammer and caused considerable damage actually that was finally repaired. Uh, there was a great Harvard Lampoon uh, cartoon of that moment of, of where he's got the hammer and it says, oh my God, Pieta, I thought it said Pinata. Uh, but what you may not know is that about 10 years ago now, when the fountain, the Duchamp, was uh, being displayed in Nîmes, a man attacked it, attacked it with a hammer and was arrested. And things got really interesting because it turned out, first of all, that he came from saint Rémy, the madhouse where, where uh, uh, Van Gogh had been down the street from Nîmes. But in his defense, at the trial, he, he said that this was the second time he had attacked it. That the first time had been five years earlier when it was at the Pompidou Center in Paris, and that in what to my mind is perhaps the greatest act of performance art of our time, he had peed into it. <laughs> and he said that once he had peed into it, the object was in a rictus of embarrassment because it had found its true nature to be a toilet and it was now being gawked at, gawped at by people as art, and he was only trying to put it out of its misery. And as you know, there's countless variations, there's Sherry, and, and uh, maybe Alex will ask me some questions about this uh, piece because it's also very important. He has some good ideas. Alex Melamed is here, and he has some very important ideas about this piece. But this is Sherry Levine doing one in gold, which of course is a parody of the of the uh, youth uh, of the of the value exchange when you suddenly take a toilet and turn it into uh, art, and then you take a, a piece of art and turn it into gold. And you have Liza Liu, who, in, who you know, beads the world. She beads her kitchen. She beaded a uh, solitary confinement. This is all bead work. And then she beaded a toilet in homage to Duchamp. That's all bead work there. And also, her name is Liza Liu, so it's, it's a self-portrait. 